You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Hello and welcome to another Citations Classics, another adventure in trauma. Anybody interested in trauma or any trauma topic worth its salt is going to have to dive into the pelvis at some point, get your hands in the pelvis, get, get in the action. And, and we wanted to, to start big with it. So we're going to start talking about pelvic ring injuries. Um, so in general, it's important to, when we're talking about pelvis injuries, there's kind of two main separations. There's the pelvic ring and there's the acetabulum. The acetabulum, of course, being where the femur articulates with the pelvis itself and the pelvic ring injuries being disruptions in the ring itself, which goes, uh, is basically how we connect our spine to our lower extremity. And any uh, complete disruption of this causes an instability, which we wanna make sure that we help stabilize. So this is about talking about a little bit more about how we uh, can classify. Here we have, up, if you're watching it on uh, YouTube, we have a, a graphic of the young Burgess classification talking about the different uh, patterns of injury being an AP or LC. Um, the, as far as the scope of this talk, I mean, we could just spend hours and hours talking about this. We wanted to focus on LC1 injuries, as these are very common, kind of a ground level fall in elderly people. And they're ones that require a decision to be made of operative versus non-operative management. So like our big severe pelvic ring injuries, of course, we need to, to uh, treat those. But so we wanted to talk about something that had a decision point of operative versus non-operative. We wanna look into some of the research, which kind of helps supports how we make that decision um, full disclosure, there's still, it's still kind of being ironed out a little bit, I think, but I think we've got some good guidelines that have been developed over the course of some years. Um, but of course we don't want to miss discussing the APC injuries. And so we've included an article as well, kind of highlighting some of the important info that we can use to counsel our patients as we're moving forward. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with our, our first paper. We're talking about an APC injury. I think just to, to have someone or have someone in your mind, a patient presentation in your mind, we'll talk about this paper kind of in the context of, hey, someone came in, they were in an MVC, they had APC2, so a widened uh, uh, pelvic ring anteriorly, uh, and we know that there's some injury to the ligaments. Um, and, and we'll talk about, okay, now they're post-op day one, and what, what do we want to do to counsel them? Okay, let's go ahead and jump into it with Bree. Right. Hey, everyone. It's great. Um, I'll be reviewing Dr. Putnus and colleagues' 2011 article, ORIF of a Traumatic Diastasis of the Pubic Symphysis, One-Year Radiological and Functional Outcomes. So just to give a little bit of background, our pubic symphysis is a fibrocartilaginous band that helps to form the anterior joint of the pelvic ring. And that, along with our posterior SI joints, will allow for a rotation and expansion of the pelvis. But if this pubic symphysis becomes disrupted, which we call a diastasis, um, it's usually associated with high energy trauma and uh, anterior posterior compression injuries are usually our most common pattern. And diastasis usually has some characteristic radiographic patterns, uh, depending on the specific mechanism of injury. Uh, but as I said before, that can be anterior posterior compression, lateral compression, vertical shear, or a combination of these three types of injuries. And if you're following along with the slides, um, we're just showing a diagram of the Young and Burgess classification of pelvic ring fractures. Um, I'm going to be reviewing the APC category since that'll be really important in this paper. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, our APC1 category is essentially just a pubic diastasis, and that's going to be less than 2.5 centimeters. It's going to be stable because our link event to structures such as our sacrotuberous ligament and sacrospinous ligaments are still intact. But when we progress to an APC2 category, that pubic symphysis widens, it gets bigger than 2.5 centimeters, and we start to have some ligamentous disruption due to increased spreading of those ligaments um, leading to further instability. And then when we get to APC3, that's when we get to very unstable uh, pelvic ring fractures uh, because of the loss of our, the majority of our sacroiliac ligaments. 
And then the other two categories that we'll get into in other papers will be uh, lateral compression and vertical shear. So the authors of this study conducted a 16 month retrospective review of ORIF for traumatic diastasis of the pubic symphysis at a tertiary referral center. And they decided to include any patients who underwent ORIF of the pubic symphysis with a diastasis greater than 25 millimeters, either with or without posterior displacement. And they excluded any patients with open injuries, acetabular fractures, iliosacral dislocation, and those who underwent definitive management with external pelvic fixator. So the aims of their study were first to determine the incidence of radio radiologic evidence of movement after anterior pelvic fixation within a year of surgery, and then to determine if these changes affected their functional outcomes. So with their outcomes, they decided to look at both uh, functional outcomes using a SF12 questionnaire to determine patients' physical and mental health with an additional six questions to determine specifically pelvic injury. Um, and then they also looked at movement with plain AP and inlet and outlet pelvic radiographs at three, six, and 12 months postoperatively to look for any signs of hardware failure or recurrent diastasis. And they were able to identify 49 patients. Um, uh, they were about a mean of 42 years of age and 82% of these patients were male. Interestingly, about half of the injuries were attributed to motor motorcycle accidents uh, just because of the way that riders are seated on a motorcycle. And all of these patients underwent ORAF of the anterior pelvic ring with fixation using either one or two pelvic reconstruction plates. But posterior fixation was mandatory if there was a vertical pelvic instability. Um, on, on preoperative imaging, otherwise it was based on surgeon preference, whether that was used. So what they were able to find in this study was that of the 49 patients they identified, 19 underwent anterior fixation for APC2 fractures and the remaining 30 required additional posterior fixation. About 15 of these 49 patients had radiographic evidence of anterior metalwork movement, secondary to either broken or loosening hardware. Um, and this was a greater incidence than was previously reported, which was about 5 to 12%. And this may just because they included any degree of movement of hardware, and it may not necessarily be due to a loss of reduction or that there was any difference in outcomes versus those had, that had radiographically stable metal work. And lastly, they also found that six patients with APC2 category injuries experienced concomitant recurrent diastasis, and only four of these required revision. So of the 49 patients overall, only four with recurrent diastasis required further surgery. And then jumping into their questionnaire that they completed, um, about 14 of the 15 patients with signs of loosening metal work um, completed the questionnaires. And that showed that it, there was about a 20% decrease in physical ability compared to the normal population, but they didn't find this to be statistically significant. And they also found that pelvic pain was the main cause of loss of function, but there was really no correlation between where the fixation was, the location of pain, or the type of fixation. And really, when you're looking at these results, it's evident that even patients with radiographically stable metal work still experience pain. Um, so when we jump into the questionnaire that the uh, study used, they found that 14 of the 15 patients with signs of loosened metal work had a 20% decrease in physical ability compared to the normal population, but this was not found to be statistically significant. Uh, pelvic pain was the main cause of loss of function, but there was no correlation between the type of fixation, 
or the location of pain. And one thing that's important to note is that in this results table, you can see that even patients with radiographically stable metal work still experienced pain as well. So it was common amongst stable and unstable metal work. So in conclusion, the authors found that postoperative radiographic signs of movement in the anterior metal work were common, but functional outcomes were comparable with the rest of the group. And really metal work movement overall didn't correlate with any reduced functional outcomes. So it's not a sole indication for revision surgery unless a patient has a combined recurrent symptomatic diastasis. Very nice. Yeah, Bree, that was, that was great. And so I, I think there's some really interesting things that are by this paper and kind of ideas that are, that are evident in this paper that kind of go into a lot of the things, ways that we think about this. And, and you, what you put on the slide here too, is that they had a failure in these APC2 fractures. And so maybe there's some type of micro instability and, and maybe they'd benefit from added posterior fixation, even for all APC2 injuries. And, and, and I don't, I don't know that that full answer by any means. And I'm not sure that we have quite drilled down on that yet as, uh, as a specialty. And uh, that once again, we can go back to, um, to surgeon preference. Uh, and as we were talking about before, the, the important thing about APC2 is that with that 2.5 centimeters of diastasis that by definition means that we know that we've torn that sacro tuberous and the sacrospinous ligament so there is some instability moving towards the back that's what makes it a two and not a one so it makes sense that maybe it could be improved by a little bit of additional fixation and then and then finally like you said you know there might be some some lucency or moving of the metalwork but uh, that doesn't necessarily correlate with pain. And that makes sense, right? This is a, this is a joint that typically moves. There's, it's not fused when we're born or when we're walking around. So there's, there's some motion there. As we know, motion over time uh, can, lead, can lead to loosening. And there's a lot of forces that are going through the hip and through the, the pelvic ring. So, so Brie, when you're looking at this patient that we're talking about, you're, you're post-op day one, you're doing your post-op check, the, the um, the patient's like, doc, thank you so much. You guys fixed me. Um, what am I looking at? What am I, what am I doing? Like, how, how am I going to do? What, what are you talking about with this, with this person? What do you kind of want to bring up? Yeah. So with this patient, I really just want to stress to them that it takes time for uh, the scar tissue uh, to mature and to stabilize. And that's usually what we're waiting for to see how they're going to be doing long-term. Um, there are really small micro motions that we have during uh, walking, running, any type of ambulation. Um, so those small micro motions are expected, uh, but over time, if those accumulate and that scar tissue isn't maturing as we would expect, there is a chance that the metal work could fail. But as long as the pelvic ring remains stable, that may mean that the patient doesn't need to have surgery again, and they may be able to keep going long-term without having to return to the operating room. So really overall, our goal in talking with any of these patients with APC2 injuries is to keep the pelvic ring stable with scar tissue formation, healing between where those ligaments that ruptured previously were, and that our joints do have some motion. So if there's no signs of separation, um, then likely fibrous union is present and then they'll be able to progress from like toe touch weight bearing to full weight bearing and then be able to one day go back to their regular activities based on how their healing is progressing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's highlighting that, hey, you know, when you're, when you're following up, you might, we might pull up the images and you'll see some broken hardware and that, and that is okay. This is a, it's kind of a race against time of, the, we, we know that eventually metal work will fail. We just need the, the soft tissues to heal in the interim to give the stability back. There were soft tissues before, we're trying to bring soft tissues back into it now. Uh, and we're not gonna be able to see those in x-rays and we might be able to see um, some, some hardware breakage and that is okay. And then also can even bring up, you know, folks do have pain after this, this injury type, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's from any type of hardware or anything like that. It could be people with intact hardware and people with broken hardware do have pain. 
that's more likely a conversation that's going to be post-operatively if they're continuing to have pain you can kind of dive into that a little bit more but i think just getting into their into their head the idea that you know if they see broken hardware at a follow appointment that's okay um kind of help set the stage that way but yeah that's, that's perfect right on good work all right let's go ahead and move on to some uh some lateral compression type i think this is a little bit more of there's a little bit of a crossroads of what to do and some decision making that needs to be done so nick what you got hey everybody it's nick todd again so we're going to be talking about uh dr gasky at all's paper non-operative treatment of intermediate severity lateral compression type one pelvic ring injuries with minimally displaced complete sacral fractures. This was published in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2014. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So a little bit of background before we uh, get too deep. So there's a little bit of controversy that exists over a uh, treatment of our Young and Burgess uh, LC1 type injuries. Uh, some people are advocating for a non-surgical uh, treatment for all. Others are saying fixation and early mobilization. There has been some recent literature that have attempted to characterize uh, some subsets of LC1 injuries um, that are prone to displacement later on. Um, however, there is some data that is lacking in functional outcomes. There was some research by Bruce et al. that described uh, a subset of LC1 injuries with complete sacral fractures that may cause instability, but again, we're still missing uh, some functional outcome data. So the goal of this paper and uh, Gasky's research was to identify a subgroup of the Young Burgess model and to certainly not redefine it or create a new uh, classification system. So we were focused on those with an LC1 injury with intermediate severity defined by the injury severity scale and complete sacral fractures with displacement less than 10 millimeters. The study was aimed at functional outcomes in this subgroup that was treated non-operatively. So just a reminder for those people following along uh, on the slide. So an LC1 type injury is a compression fracture of the pubic rami and an ipsilateral anterior sacral fracture. Yeah, perfect. And, and, and Nick, I'm gonna hop in here because I know this is something that was, when I was starting to take call and, uh, as, a, as a two and you're getting these calls for, for pubic rami fractures, you're looking in the back at the sacrum, you're trying to decide if it's LC1 or LC2, looking at the, um, it's several ilium to see if there's any involvement there. And I remember looking at them like, I mean, so I'm, it's, it's both rami and the sacrum's involved. So it's an LC1 non-operative fracture. Okay. That makes, that makes kind of sense. And then I'm looking at them a little bit more and I was like, well, but what if, what if this is a, it's not just a sacral buckle fracture. I start seeing that fracture line going all the way into the posterior elements of the sacrum. That makes you start thinking maybe this is a little bit more unstable. The same time it's compression so that means that the ligaments are intact around it like you know compression the ligaments are only going to get squished and those they handle that just fine uh, so maybe it is actually uh, a stable injury because all those ligaments kind of bridge the area of the fracture in the back but if i start seeing some some diastasis back there does that make it unstable and so kind of diving in like okay they're they're like they're saying there is a little bit of a subset a little bit of difference lc1 can kind of have a, a large uh, scope of injuries mm -hmm. and there's a difference when there's when there's diastasis so that this paper when i saw it was like oh my gosh that's exactly what was causing me so much confusion right uh, right so, so this is great um, and so um really interesting paper to talk about and to see and so i'm, I'm, I'm pumped to see you jump jump into this um, right yeah just kind of describing that for for all folks listening um all right sorry yeah sorry uh so, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep keep it moving keep it a go it's a little bit about this study. So this is a prospective study. Uh, we had 50 people involved in the study. Our inclusion criteria was an LC1 type injury, intermediate severity, skeleton mature, age less than 80 years old, uh, 10 millimeters displaced, and complete sacral fracture, treated non-surgically, of course. Our exclusion criteria, over 80 years old, severe cognitive dysfunction, or a cognitive, or a, excuse me, or a spinal cord injury. So our method. So we're looking at the Majeed pelvic score, which we'll talk about in just a second. We'll put up on the slide screen uh, and the physical component summary um, and the mental component summary score. So 50 patients were contacted for functional outcome assessment using these scores uh, at an average follow-up of 33 months. 
So for those following along on the slides, uh, I have the Majid pelvic score shown. This is quite a comprehensive score um, for those that are just listening, going through uh, many details of the patient's uh, daily living and their pain, uh, whether or not they can work, whether or not they can sit comfortably or not, uh, how they stand, how they walk, um, how their gait appears, and uh, how far they can walk, among other things. And there's some subsets of each of these categories, and there's a score that goes along with each one of these categories. So our results, the average Majid pelvic score is 85.5. So this was uh, classified as 33 of these were considered excellent, nine were considered good, five were considered fair, and three poor. So this is, uh, so largely out of the 50 people that were uh, in the study, we have 33 excellent, nine good. So that's uh, quite a significant amount having good or better uh, outcomes with only five fair and eight poor. So that's eight of the 50 having just fair or below uh, outcomes. Um, another quote from the article, we have 35 of 37 patients without lower extremity injury had good or excellent categorical outcomes based on the Majid pelvic score. Um, so what this is pretty much saying is, you know, people with these types of injuries uh, do well non-surgically. So in conclusion, so we have the subset that uh, Gasket was able to identify that have intermediate severity, LC1, with uh, one centimeter displaced and complete sacral fracture. They can be treated non-operatively with relatively good functional outcomes. Um, we could say the only drawback of this study is a small sample size of 50. Uh, but I think considering that the results are uh, really consistent with a lot of people uh, doing well, I think that should be uh, taken into consideration. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this is, this is exactly right. So this is the, the kind of those worrisome papers. There's a, a pa people, patients, there's a, there's a little bit more going on, on on the radiographs and with their injury pattern. But I think this is a pretty reassuring thing that, you know what, a lot of these folks can be treated non-operatively. Uh, and and have good outcomes but we do see there there are a group of people that don't that don't do well and so uh, maybe they would benefit from surgery and it's kind of keeping our back of our mind hey can we how can we kind of suss out who these people are that would benefit or how can we talk with our patients and, and figure it out and should we be doing non-op on all of these patients should we operating operative fixation for some of them and if so who um to kind of drill down a little bit more into this, like, hey, you know, this is a small sample size. There were some that didn't do well. Uh, we have a second paper that kind of dump, jumps into that. And before we do too much of a conversation about LC1, um, we'll go ahead and, and, and go through that paper here real quick. So this is a non-operative immediate weight bearing of minimally displaced lateral compression sacral fracture does not result in displacement. Kind of gives away the, <laughs> the, the ending, but we'll, we'll go through it a little bit here. This is by Solis, Lean, and Tornetta um, out, of, out of Baltimore, and it was published in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2012. We'll be able to go through fairly quickly because you kind of can see the punchline a little bit, and you've heard a lot of it from, uh, from Nick already. But here, it's basically, they found 421 patients at a level one center from 2000 to 2008 with uh, a lot of compression uh, pelvic fractures. They looked up uh, skeletally mature patients with less than 10 millimeters of displacement, like, you know, so folks that are having LC1 injuries. They've made sure that the patients had six, at least six week follow up, uh, and that ultimately found 118 patients. And I have up here on the method slide, they have how the, the radiographs were evaluated to, to determine this less than 10 millimeters of displacement. Basically, doing a plumb line down, down the, uh, the spinal, um, the vertebral spines down through the center of the sacrum and, and seeing where it bisected the pelvic symphysis to determine their, their rotation. And they measured um, ischial height, they measured uh, sacral width, they measured um, uh, iliac wing height, sacral height, as well as overall width of the, of the pelvis and the pelvic ring width. Basically just seeing from all these different things, what changed, were there any changes and these all needed to be less than 10 millimeters in that initial presentation. They wanted to make sure they had six week follow up. And the reason why they chose six weeks is typically folks that are treated uh, non operatively have been able to start advancing their weight bearing. They've been uh, doing more on their affected extremity. And so they're evaluating hey, as this person's starting to heal, 
are there having any change in their alignment on radiographs? And then also, how are they doing clinically? So the results, they had out of the 118, they had 110 patients with final displacement less than 10 millimeters. They had eight patients, patients with displacement greater than 10 millimeters in one or more of those, um, of those measurements. They had six with iliac wing height difference. They had two with sacral height difference and five with ischial height difference. Once again, they could have uh, more than one. That's why those numbers don't quite match up. Um, I thought it was interesting that there was a, a, a significant number that had the affected side that was actually displaced inferiorly as compared to the unaffected side. When I was thinking about these, I thought, you know, if someone's walking on something that's a little bit more unstable, we'd probably get vertical displacement of that side, but it shows how heavy the leg is that even in stance and when you're going around um, that the affected side can be displaced inferiorly. That's why we, we like to do toe touch weight bearing as much as we can to decrease the joint reactive forces there. And interestingly, out of the 118, they had one that failed a non optical treatment. They had an additional five millimeters of additional sacral displacement from the time of injury that ultimately put them over that 10 millimeter threshold, but they only had five additional. And the big thing that, that uh, was causing them to, to fail non-operative management was continued pain with weight bearing and rolling around in bed. So they just, just couldn't, couldn't stay comfortable. They eventually got operative fixation and did very, very well. Um, so pretty convincing, you know, we got 110 out of 118 that, that did very well. They did not continue to displace later on. Uh, and so I think a pretty strong um, idea that, hey, we could go ahead and continue with non-operative management with these LC1s even with a with minimal displacement. So the conclusions that they took was that the LC1 injuries can weight bear immediately without dis dis significant displacement and, and continue on to, to good function. I did want to make an important note about their protocol. And when you're reading their paper, it's interesting. So they, their process and their protocol when evaluating these patients, and I think is a, is a really good note, is anyone who came in with this LC1, they had a trial of weight bearing in house and worked with physical therapy. And they would obtain repeat radiographs after ambulation uh, of 50 feet. So once this patient was able to walk 50 feet, they would get repeat films and look and see if they displaced more. If they displaced more, then they would sit down and talk with the patient. Hey, we see a little bit of extra motion after you've been weight bearing how's your pain? This is kind of, do, they start talking about operative uh, fixation at that point. Um, and this wasn't really addressed in the paper as far as what par portion of their study population actually had displacement kind of on that initial radiographs or if they didn't or how that, how that conversation went with various patients. I'd be curious to see how that affects their patient population. Uh, and so our thoughts from this was, there still is a possibility that people can fail this treatment just like any other. This was only only one or, um, ultimately failed to, re, to need revision, uh, to need a surgery. But, you know, eight folks did have changing of the radiographic parameters. And so it seems like anything shared decision making and, and communication set the stage for success. And, and I think that important thing about their protocol of ambulation, repeat imaging, and then a conversation uh, is, is a really big one. So kind of with all this, uh, Nick, with the patient, let, let's see you have a patient who is an LC1. They sustain, you know, elderly, an elder patient sustains a ground level fall. You see rami fractures on the x-ray. You're concerned about the, the posterior elements. See, so uh, ED has already gotten a CT. You're looking at it. You see a complete sacral fracture displaced five millimeters, we'll say. What, what, do, you, what, what do you think you're gonna do with this person? or how do you think you can continue to evaluate them? Right, so taking into consideration what we've just been talking about and this last paper we were just talking about, I think uh, what would be reasonable is have our uh, physical therapy colleagues come in and try and do uh, trial weight bearing with the patient and see how it goes. Yeah, 100%, I think it's totally, we need to stress it somehow. We know that for the vast majority of patients, it seems like they do great. They can get up, walk around. They, they have some pain, of course, but if they're able to get around and move around and let the healing start, they're going to do, do just fine. But there's some people that don't. Right. And so, so figuring out a way to stress them in the hospital. That's great. So a trial of weight bearing and repeat radiographs or just see how they're able to mobilize. That's great. Um, 
And so that's led to some other different ideas. We don't cover them here, but I think it's really interesting. There's actually a, a JBJS article earlier this year, I think it was in March, that talks about getting stress views of the pelvis, basically doing our, um, you know, where you're doing internal compression, where you're taking the, the iliac wings and squeezing them together uh, and getting in a radiograph of that and then challenging it by pushing down on the ASISs, trying to, to book open the pelvis, seeing if there's any displacement when you do that. There's also single stance weight bearing x-rays where you're having them stand on one leg and seeing what happens to the, to the pelvis on radiographs as well. So there's a couple different ideas and it seems like basically if we're talking to our patient, we say, hey, most people do really great. Some people don't, let's get you started. If you're continuing to have a lot of pain, then maybe it's a reason to, to do some uh, uh, a relatively, and I say relatively, um, straightforward procedure of, of some posterior fixation to help them. And we'll go into what that, that is. Anything in the pelvis is really not straightforward, but, uh, but uh, of course, um, there are different degrees of pelvic surgery, as everyone's aware of, so as far as percutaneous versus open. Uh, but yeah, great, great job, guys. We got, um, I did want to do one final paper where we talk about what, what that surgical management might be. Um, it's a, a great article out of, um, um, out of Harborview that basically talks about the, the strategy or a strategy to do percutaneous fixation and how to do it uh, under fluoro and with confidence that you're not going to cause any injury to any of the neural elements around. Because as we know, spinal cord is important and it is in and around the pelvis. <laughs> Well, I suppose not the cord, excuse me, the, uh, the uh, nerve roots. Uh, make sure that we're, we're not mixing up the cord and the roots, of course. So here we have uh, Gardner et al. Uh, this was published in the Journal of Trauma, Injury, Infection, and Critical Care in 2009. And this is the percutaneous placement of iliosacral screws without electrodiagnostic monitoring. For those of you that are uh, listening and not watching, I would highly encourage either pull up this paper or just skip to this part of the YouTube video just to see some of their, their radiographs that they put up or the intraoperative flora they put up. It really kind of cements some of the things that we're looking at when we're making sure that we're putting in the screw safely. So some background. Um, the iatric nerve injuries during percutaneous SI screw placement are reported to be as high as 18% at the time of the, this, um, this paper. Because of this, there are some authors that were recommending the use of neurodiagnostic monitoring, the, the author, and just making sure that you're not injuring any nerves. Uh, the authors argue that this is very costly. It, it may not actually make a difference as far as the rate of injury. You just know sooner that you injured it. Uh, and it may give a false sense of security to folks as they're putting it in that, okay, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll be all right if I'm, I'm in the wrong spot, then the, the monitoring will tell me. And they argue that the best thing to do is just to make sure that you're not in the wrong spot by very much scrutinizing your fluoro and having a good, uh, a good process. And they also argue that these studies reporting a high complication rate involve uh, various guidance techniques. And so they wanted to present a single unified guidance technique that has been shown or, or, or that, they, that they're looking into to make sure that it shows that there's a safe way to do it and it's reproducible. So just some background on neuro monitoring. There's kind of a couple different main ones. There's somatosensory evoked potentials. These are basically signals that are recorded from the scalp or the spine that happens after you stimulate the peripheral nerve. So it's taking advantage of the afferent system, afferent system. Basically it's, you poke the nerve and see if it changes over surgery. You can either do it by um, stimulating the nerve peripherally by causing the muscle to contract or, or just um, having some type of, excuse me, afferent, having the, uh, sensation going up the nerve and seeing if there's anything that interferes with that as a course of, of your surgery. There's also continuous electromyography. This basically monitors depolarization of a nerve by reading the electric potential of a muscle it innervates, which is the efferent system, which basically is if you're doing your surgery and you're poking a nerve and the nerve is having is being stressed, the axons will depolarize as a response to that injury and you'll be able to see the muscle twitching not see with your eyes, but you'll be able to record um, its output and be able to see its response. And you know, oh, oh, I'm, I'm too close that the nerve is seeing pain or seeing uh, stimulation. And then finally, there's stimulus evoked electromyography, which is basically stimulus, which is a shock, is delivered through the instruments as you're making a path and you're evaluating if that's getting too close. And so basically you're, you're putting an electric current through your instruments as you're advancing them and, and you're measuring just like you would with the continuous electromyography, you're seeing if the nerve is 
uh, being stimulated. And that's hopefully a way to do it before the nerve is actually being contacted by the instruments and, and a kind of way to, to warn yourself as you're getting closer. See a lot of that in spine surgery. So what were the methods? They did 21 months at a single trauma center, uh, but they did 326 patients with a pelvic ring. 174 of them were stabilized. 66 had an open reduction. Uh, and so they were uh, excluded. They had 24 that were intubated prior to neuro exams. So they couldn't really compare the neuro exams, so they were excluded. And 16 had pre-op neuro deficits. So, so therefore, 68 patients remained for the study group. They were evaluated with radiographs, CT, as well as a comprehensive neuro exam focusing on L5, S1, and S2, um, preoperatively and postoperatively to make sure there's no change. And they also looked at the CT scan of the screw placement just to define them as either intraosseous, which meant that they had uh, cancellous bone around the, the screw, the uh, juxtaforaminal, which means that there was still was a cortex intact, but there was no... Um, cancellous bone around the screw, but there was good cortical bone around the screw. And then extra osseous, which meant that there was no cortical bone around the screw and it was, it was um, um, out there, uh, possibly involved in the, in the foramen. Um, to cut to the chase, they had no screws that were placed extra osseously, but we'll talk about it. Uh, they were all intraosseously or juxtaforaminal, so um, a very reassuring there. So the, what's the operative technique? Uh, one, it's, they were looking at the inlet and the outlet. Important that you define an inlet where the, uh, and you can see on the pictures here, but the, the anterior cortices of S1 and S2 are overlapped on a true inlet view. And then for an outlet view, the superior symphysis is overlying the middle of the S2 um, sacral body. And you here you have a picture with the kind of arrows pointing at those. And this is, once again, these are pictures from their paper. Um, and then taking a look here on our outlet view, in order to make sure that we're heading in the direct, uh, the correct way, you can see kind of what they call the spica cast of the course or the root, the course of the nerve root, where you can see the cortical density is coming down, and you can see the uh, exiting S1 foramina. Um, and so here they say, you know, you find your start point, you want to make sure you're heading the right way, and you you can advance your drill all the way to this border on the AP or uh, or on the AP or on the, the outlet to make sure that you're not getting into or you haven't committed to a path that is breaching the, um, the nerve root or the nerve canal. And then at that point, switch over to the lateral. And on the lateral, you want to align the greater sciatic notches, which you can see with that little arrow there. You also want to uh, align the iliac cortical densities, which you can see um, with the, the white arrowheads. Uh, you can see the black dotted line is the anterior part of the foramen, and then the, the black arrowheads are the posterior part of the foramen. So you can see here when you have a, a great lateral, which is the, you can see the superimposed uh, sciatic notches. You can see the great uh, um, iliac cortical densities. That's really the important thing to make sure it's one solid line. And with that, you can make sure that you're staying anterior to the S1 uh, canal and post here to the cortical densities and you know you're staying in good bone. Once you have that, you feel comfortable advancing your, your screw uh, or your drill forward. Uh, and then making sure that you're, you, have, you have good purchase. So here are the, the overall the results, you have 106 screws placed in 68 patients. So 75 were determined to be intraosseous, which with good cancellous bone around it on CT scan. 31 were juxtaforaminal with uh, bone still around the screw, but uh, it was cortical, cortical bone. And zero were found to be extra osseous. They found no patients with sensory or motor changes uh, from pre-op to post-op. So basically the conclusions of this is take your time and plan thoroughly. Look at the imaging, look at the morphology of the patient, see how big that corridor is that you're aiming for. Make sure you can obtain the imaging you need intraoperatively with a perfect uh, inlet, perfect outlet. Um, and know that you know, you're know you advancing, make sure you can really see the neuroforamina of S1, uh, that spike of cast as you're advancing it. 
once you get to the, the border of that spike of cast, you switch over to the lateral, make sure you are posterior to the iliac cortical densities and anterior to the nerve uh, foramen. And the way you can tell that you actually can trust what you see is you have those overlapped iliac cortical densities um, in the greater sciatic foramen. Basically, it's pay attention and trust yourself, not monitoring. Don't rely on something to keep you out of trouble. Keep yourself out of trouble. Um, and I, I, just, I just really enjoyed this, uh, this article as just something, a way to prepare for, for surgery to look at, to be able to really scrutinize imaging and see what the important uh, aspects of the, of the uh, physiology is when you're, when you're getting those images in, in, intraoperatively, just to be able, what to look for in order to confirm that you know where you are and, and you're staying safe. So I thought it was a, a really great article to kind of close this out of, hey, when we, we do get to those patients who need it, we can do this kind of minimally uh, invasive procedure and we can do it. If we do it in this reproducive and thoughtful way, we can do it in a very safe manner, uh, reproducible manner without undue risk to our patients for something that could really cause some trouble. All right, so there we have it. Pelvic ring, guys. We did it. Good work. Um, thank you all for your for your attention. We're, we're excited to, to do another one, and we're getting looking started uh, some acetabulum next time around. So have a great one.